which I've been doing and I still go. And one, one other thing, we do have one class that is directly involved in teaching still, and that's a combined UCSC Soledad class where UCSC students go into Soledad and work with their counterparts inside the prison. It's organized by the men inside who are now teaching there. And the university has generously agreed to give two course credits, university course credits to the men inside for their participation in the class. So that's another step forward. Okay, thank you. And, and John will be given, giving the uh, Spring Maritime Lecture Award that's the 11th of April, 7 p.m. in the Hate Barn. All right, and with that, uh, introduce the chancellor today. Uh, you know, this COVID time, we've all been in a, in a kind of weird time zone, and I'm looking it up. How long has Cindy been here? This is the fourth year. It seems probably since like 14 to Cindy. All right, Cindy Larie. Thanks so much, Barry. You know, the time flies here in Santa Cruz, and it's um, it doesn't seem quite like four years, but then I think I spent a year and a half in my attic, so that counts for some of it. Uh, it's just such a pleasure to see you all here today, and I'm so grateful that we could gather. Are we on... on are we broadcasting it or recording? Yeah, there, there are a few people watching and we're on Zoom. Let me just give my warmest regards to everybody who's not joining us here today and say thank you for attending and I hope you're all well. So uh, I am so appreciative of our maritime faculty and for your continued engagement with our wonderful campus. Um, I understand that in some cases that engagement goes back decades. Uh, your involvement and your institutional knowledge that, that uh, really helps to make us a better university. So thank you. And, you know, we've all been touched by a number of losses in the past year. And it's important, I think, that we acknowledge those who are no longer with us. The UC Santa Cruz of today is the cumulative results of so many people. I'm grateful to be part of this almost 60 year continuum, and I hope that you are as well. You know, a lot has happened since we met uh, last year in this room, uh, and uh, I don't remember the weather last year. We were probably hoping for rain last year, and now we've got it, so you know. Uh, I, I wanted to just kind of give a general update about the campus and focus on a few awards and achievements. And then at the end, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, first, though, I want to add my congratulations to John Proud Childs for receiving this Constantine Panuzio Distinguished Emeriti Award. One of the things that I think is quite interesting is that this award it's not a kind of lifetime achievement award, although John could also win that, I think. It is an award that recognizes work that someone has done since becoming an emeritus faculty member. And so John, you are such a credit to our university and have been such a wonderful force for good uh, for so many years. Thank you. I also want to congratulate I also want to congratulate Kathy Foley, Edward Houghton, and Susan Strom, our Dickinson, Dixon Professorship Award recipients this year. And thank you for continuing your innovative and impactful work. You know, if you need a luggage Sherpa, and I'm going to Bavaria sounds pretty appealing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that there are so many faculty uh, on our uh, at our university, who've gotten amazing awards and recognitions over the year, I can't um, mention them all, but there were a few I wanted to highlight. Some of them you probably will recall, but maybe others will be new to you. Uh, several of us talked uh, uh, in casual conversation about Karen Miga, who gave the crawl lecture last night, and so if you had a chance to see it was really quite a spectacular lecture. 
Karen is a assistant professor of biomedical engineering, and she leads this telomere to telomere consortium. So uh, they call it T2T -T for short. And the molecular biologist can explain all of that to you if you need to know more. But my uh, understanding as only being a chemist is that the telomeres are the ends of the DNA strands. And so to be able to really sequence across the whole DNA, covering up the many gaps that were present from the initial effort, that's it has really important implications for human health and disease and hopefully treatments of those disease. She was recognized in one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2022. Isn't that great recognition for Karen? It's great for Karen and for our campus. Last week, the AAAS, the American Association for Advancement of Science, awarded its 2023 Mentor Award to Enrico Ramirez Ruiz. Uh, he's our professor of astronomy and astrophysics, and you might remember that about a year ago, he was received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring, was one of a dozen people to be uh, recognized on the White House alone. Uh, and in, in January, three faculty members were named AAAS Fellows, Psychology Professor Gene Foxtree, Distinguished Professor of Computer Science and Engineering, Lisa Gatour, and the Dean of Baskin School of Engineering, uh, Alex Wolf. In April, I get to go to London because our Distinguished Professor of the Arts, Isaac Julian, will be having a retrospective on his career at the Tate. He's also been knighted uh, by Prince, uh, by the King Charles, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> King Charles. Uh, and uh, so he, uh, we have to call him now Sir Isaac Julian. Uh, linguist Sandra Chung was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Science. And I was just delighted to hear that Judith Scott, Professor Emerita of Education, was inducted into the Reading Hall of Fame in December. What a wonderful honor. Congratulations. So uh, our campus saw a number of, of good uh, developments over the last year. I think, think news that was pretty positive. At the start of the year, we were the only UC ranked by US News and World Report for best undergraduate teaching. In the top 10 universities yep. were recognized nationally, we were one. Uh, that, that is a tribute to our faculty, but it also, I think, is a tribute to all of you and the, the really important ways in which this campus has for a long time taken undergraduate teaching as a really important responsibility and honor. We rose in the U.S. News and World Rankings uh, uh, this year from 103 to 83, for national universities and from 46 to 35 for public universities. You know, I don't believe that you chase those rankings because they're kind of arbitrary, but uh, they are used by students and parents and others. So it's helpful, I think, to pay some attention to our standing. Uh, this past fall, um, we officially renamed the Research Center for the Americas for Dolores Huerta. I didn't know if any of you were at that event at the Hay Barn. It was one of the most moving and meaningful events I've spent in a long time. She is an amazing woman. And it is so uh, wonderful that she has lent her name to our research center for the Americas. And we got to meet many members of her family who attended. It was fun to see the students lined up to meet her. And she was so generous with her time taking photos. Then finally, about nine o'clock, she said, I think I want to dance now. And so then she danced. Uh, and she made uh, those of us who are 30 years younger uh, feel like we need to step up our games. <laughs> this fall, we received the Seal of Excellencia. Excellencia in Education is a group that pro promotes uh, data-driven uh, uh, analysis and programming to support the success of Latino students. And that it was a collective honor for our campus. 
And it would have been so it just impossible without the hard work of our HSI initiatives team and so many of our faculty. And in December, November, uh, President Michael Drake announced the designation of our campus as an agricultural experiment station. This is really a great thing. It puts us on par with Davis and Merced, or Davis and, and Riverside and Berkeley. Merced was also designated at the same regents meeting we were. Uh, that, you know, we have an amazing farm and our Center for Agroecology has done so much to promote sustainable, regenerative agriculture, develop new methods, and, and, and engage our students uh, and, in productive ways. This AES designation not only acknowledges our 50 year track record and pioneering work, uh, but it also will help us continue to build programs and expand wider fields to sustainable regenerative agriculture. I anticipate uh, that we will get additional funding to help support that work. None has arrived yet, but <laughs> we're hoping. Finally, I'm excited by our opportunities uh, through our launch of our uh, Center for Coastal Climate Resilience. This was, resulted from a $20 million award from the state of California. Uh, and it's really the money to launch the center. We have extraordinary scientists and researchers and engineers working on the focus of the center, which is nature-based solutions to adapting to climate change. Uh, if we didn't know it before, uh, the storms that we've had this winter have really driven the need for such a center home. And uh, I think that uh, we are going to be able to bring distinction to our university and make a real difference in the way that people think about adapting to climate change how we can use structures, systems, and simple things like wetlands to help mitigate uh, the sea level rise that's coming. Uh, one of the things that I learned from Michael Beck, who's the center director, is that the, the challenges that come from climate change and sea level rise isn't just that the ocean gets taller. I, I thought flooding, that makes sense because there's you know, the ocean will be higher, like a high tide. But it's, it's much different than that. It's that as, as we have uh, this climate, ch climate change, not only do we get these storms, but the power of the waves are stronger, harder. And we've seen that on West Cliff Drive and the devastation there. So Mike Beck and his colleagues have been working on these nature-based solutions. Some of it is protecting mangroves, uh, uh, rebuilding coral reefs. They're making an artificial reef around the, the joint Air uh, Navy base at Key West, Florida. This is funded by DARPA. It's really fascinating. They've studied the waves and their energy and how to diffuse it. And so they're 3D printing an infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then they use a biofilm that helps the coral grow. They're working with UPenn on a heat tolerant coral. So they're building this artificial coral reef. In our region, that won't be very helpful because it's too cold right now anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but you could imagine building a similar infrastructure and then maybe placing rocks within it to help reduce the uh, diffuse to the side of the waves. So things like that are important. Also, this week, he's hosting a meeting of the California Insurance uh, head, the head of the insurance department for California, FEMA, and the uh, California Ocean Science Institute to think about how do we how do we develop insurance policies mm -hmm. that are proactive instead of reactive. So if you could insure, for example, a coral reef, as Mike has helped happen in, in Cancun and around Hawaii, or insure wetlands in California, then, then you incentivize people to, to leave those wetlands or enhance the wetlands, and you can help to reduce the impacts of climate change when we do have a storm. I wanted to mention that, um, again, largely thanks to so many of you, our reputation continues to rise. A UC Santa Cruz education 
is seen, I think, as more desirable every year. This year, we led the UC system in the increase of applications from students who want to study here. We had 79,900 applications from freshmen and transfer students. That's a three and a half percent increase over last year. Most of the campuses actually saw a decrease in applications. We got 54,000 applications from California high school students and more than 10,000 applications from California students studying at a community college. Uh, and uh, more than 23,000 applications from California students with families with low incomes. So our student population now is about 40% first generation students, 37% Pell Grant recipients. Those Pell Grant recipients are typically from families that make less than $50,000 a year. Uh, housing is our greatest challenge here in Santa Cruz. I think everybody would probably agree with me about that. And we continue to be really um, uh, intent on our abil ability to try and address those housing needs. Um, that strategy ensures trying to envision out a pipeline of projects so that we have always things in construction and renovation. Um, the first phase of the Kresge College renewal is moving along very well. Uh, this fall, students will move into brand new residence halls. I don't know if you've been up to see it. You know, it's not one of those drive-by construction sites. You kind of have to make a track. We did make the bridge accessible. So that, that it's got a new bridge to Kresge. There'll be about 400 beds in these new dormitories that sort of ring the historic college. And those will be filled in the fall. It has student lounges, a new cafe called the Owl's Nest. And uh, then the second phase is to renovate the original buildings. And we're gonna add a floor and add some additional buildings kind of in between. All told, we'll add 600 more beds. So that's really significant in the housing that's so needed by our students. There'll also be dining options and classroom space uh, that will ultimately strengthen the student experience at UC Santa Cruz. The Kresge academic part is also just about done and will be ready uh, for maybe summer or for sure fall instruction that has a two lecture halls, a 600 person lecture hall and a 150 person lecture hall, and then two smaller flexible classrooms, one for 35 students, one for 50 students and a computer lab. So I think that will be very exciting. You might've read about our new partnership with Cabrillo College to seek state support to help fund a 600 bed project that would be, would be built on the Cabrillo uh, Gaptos campus. The Kresge phase two renovation I talked about, we got an $89 million grant for that last year from the state. That was really important because it helps to reduce the amount of money we have to borrow and therefore the expenses that students have to pay for living in the dorms. That made us ineligible to apply for grant funding for student housing for Santa Cruz this year, but Cabrillo wanted to pursue a grant for, uh, for their housing, and so we're supporting them. In that housing complex, if it were, would be built, we'd have about a third, a little more than a third of the rooms for UC Santa Cruz students. And I think that this would be so important in helping to strengthen the, the transfer pathways and the success of our transfer students, because it would be Cabrillo students. We would provide the, res the RAs, the residential student life, and our students could also be employed as tutors and peer mentors. You can think about a student who starts at Cabrillo, lives in the housing, and then maybe goes to Santa Cruz, stays there, works as an RA. It could really, I think, be a good example of successful university community college partnerships. But we have to wait and see if they get their funding. Uh, we continue our work on Student Housing West. And next week, I will ask the regions to approve the financials for that project. The first phase focuses on new housing for student families and a new and importantly larger childcare facility that will serve both students and employees. You know, we talk a lot about how housing has been 
affected in the last four years. More people from Silicon Valley wanting to live in Santa Cruz and the loss of the houses, um, so many in our region due to the CZU fire. But child care has probably been even more devastatingly impacted. So many private child care centers have closed. Our faculty and staff with children really are struggling. So if we could uh, get the region's approval, that would allow us to bring family student housing and the child care center online for fall 2025. Uh, the second phase of the project, you probably recall, includes apartments for undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, and that will be on the current family student housing site. That would be completed by fall 2028. No, I'm sure you all are aware how housing is such a challenge for our graduate students. So right now we only have about 80 uh, apartment units for graduate students on campus. That's so much less than other campuses are able to provide. And this would be a start towards meeting that need. All told, the project would provide uh, over 3,000 desperately needing beds for our current student enrollment. And you know we know that housing pressures are acute in our community. So we have worked intently, Lori and I, to keep enrollment flat since we started in our positions. Sometimes students get confused and they think, Housing is so hard, but you're always bringing in these additional students. That's because the other ones graduate, but the total enrollment of the campus has been flat. Uh, finally, I'd like to update you about our strategic, strategic planning effort, which we're calling Leading the Change. Uh, and we've done significant work uh, starting in the fall with the steering committee, and we have five thematic committees. Uh, to gather and use community input to identify goals in each area and metrics to help our track our progress towards those goals. So sometimes with a, a strategic plan, people will bring in a set of consultants and they shop around ideas and try and say, what should be the goals of the university to have our goals, right? They're to advance student success, to increase our research impact, improve our campus climate so everybody feels included, and to be efficient and effective, and resilient, and sustainable in all that we do. But what we don't have is really a plan of how we can really advance those goals. So the you know, five committees map onto our goals. There are five instead of four because we split undergraduate student <laughs> success and experience from graduate education for the future because they are really in two different domains. But uh, I'm excited uh, by the work that's being done. You might have uh, gotten a chance to respond to our survey. If so, thank you. Uh, there's going to be about another few weeks of engagement opportunities. And then at the end of April, we expect we'll have the reports from each of the committees. Those will be made available for community input and comment. They'll go to the Academic Senate for consultation. And then over the summer, we hope to stitch together the final plan and make it available for everybody at the start of school in the fall. The important thing, though, is to know that the planning is like the easy part, right? The real work is an implementation. So we'll be creating an implementation committee that will uh, follow this through and a set of dashboards for all the metrics so that we can actually chart whether we're making progress towards achieving our goals. And if not, well, maybe we say, what else should we be doing? So the goal is to have a, a plan that we can really uh, guide our work and, and our budget over the next decade. Well, with that, I'd be glad to take any questions that you might have. Questions for Dan? One of the exciting things last year was about extending the faculty. Uh, yeah, we ha we have already done some of that initial work in the searches that were allocated this year. So the way that searches happen is that the the provost uh, releases a, a kind of call for plans from each of the academic divisions. Those come forward, and then there will be some number of of um, positions that are funded centrally that are additional positions and then some some amount that are funded as 
uh, replacements for uh, faculty who retire or separate. And so we can account for those things. We don't want to count people, though, until they're actually physically here on the campus, because we all know searches sometimes, you know, they don't go right away. But I hope that by next year, we may be able to be able to give you a preliminary report on that. So that's a kind of long-term goal. Uh, and uh, I think that, um, it, you know, we, we have time to do that and to absorb people in a way that merely makes good sense and doesn't stress our systems. But thanks for the question. I think it's very exciting. Yes, Susan. Susan. Is there any um, hope for working with the city? This is regarding the housing situation on the city making more off-campus housing available to students and keeping rents affordable. Yeah, I don't I don't think the city will do that. Um, you know, we would like to be able to um, engage in some off-campus housing. Uh, perhaps um, there's a, one project in particular we've talked with the developer that would go along Delaware that seems to me to be perfect. If we could, if we could get, say, a long-term lease for some of those apartments, they could be both for students, upper division students. I don't think we'd want to put, you know, freshmen there, but uh, graduate students, uh, new faculty or new staff, kind of as a landing pad. Uh, I don't know whether the city will permit us to do that, but that would be something that I would be really yeah, positive about. We do see a lot of development going up downtown and I read about other ones that may be coming online. So I think there's some hope that the housing situation in Santa Cruz might begin to ease just a little bit. But I think that if we want affordable housing for our students and, and our faculty and staff, we have to be the driver for that. No one else will be called to risk, I'm afraid. Okay, we now actually we've got one online. Oh great. So Peter, could you unmute yourself? It's Peter Scott. Yeah, I, I uh, was wondering if you would be supportive of student housing co-ops off campus. Berkeley has them and they have turned out to be very successful in uh, costing students uh, about half of the uh, cost of commercial housing or even on-campus housing. Yeah, so thank you for that question. I think Santa Barbara also has some. So I've asked about that. They're typically not run by the university. So they're co-op buildings or houses or even apartments that have been um, often donated uh, for the use of students and the students actually run them themselves. So I don't think that it's something that the university can do, um, especially in our engagements with the city. So the city doesn't want the university to buy up a whole bunch of houses in town. But if, if, uh, if someone uh, wanted to do something like that, I'm sure that the students would be you know, very enthusiastic about it. Thank you for the question. Sure. David. Um, I've noticed all these solar panels for the whole the parking lot. I'm thinking about the campus has a, oh, a carbon zero goal and how we're doing there that so we can get that to the campus. Do we have a chance to post to be asked to be doing that? Yeah. Thank you. So the, the, we're no longer thinking about being carbon neutral in the UC system. We're thinking about being fossil free. That's a much harder goal. And we got um, th th this year some funding from the office of the president. We'd actually started the work before we knew we were gonna get the funding. So that was helpful. Mm -hmm. On a task force and a set of consultants, something that we're calling decarbonization and electrification. And so it is about um, reducing or eliminating our fossil fuel usage. One of the major barriers we have is our electrical grid. Um, many of you know that our electricity isn't very stable. Beyond that, you noticed that. So beyond that, uh, 
we have a lot of regions of the campus where the circuits won't take the additional load. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to balance, you know, things that we can do now uh, versus things we might do in the future. Student Housing West incorporates in its design solar panels. We have a proposal to build a solar um, powered microgrid for both West Side Research Park and Coastal Science Campus. That's a place we can do it because it's on a different electric grid. And I think that could be really very important, especially for West Side Research Park, we're right now renovating that building and it needs a new roof. So if you're gonna put on a new roof, that's the perfect time to add some solar panels, I think. So we have a working group that's working on it. And, and uh, we have one of our, you know, I talked about how we're sort of mapping the strategic planning committees onto, the, onto our campus goals. We have a committee working on uh, climate resilience and sustainability. And so I think they're also going to propose trying to get to being fossil free. Um, we, we'd like to do it by 2030. I don't think it's gonna be feasible, but I'm, I'm torn between wanting to set an ambitious goal because that helps you try and get as far as you can versus having everybody disappointed when you don't make your goal. Uh, the consultants have advised us that that goal by 2030 will cost us um, between 750 and $900 million. <laughs> uh, it would be something though that would be economical probably in the long run, right? Uh, but uh, it so it, there's a lot of challenges there. We have to address them though. And I, I just think you just keep working at it, don't you? Okay, further questions? Well, well let me ask one. Sure. So, uh, I mean, all of us have been interested in teaching our whole careers. And recently with social media and Zooming, how how are our students doing? What is the report and, and, and how are we able to actually assess how they're doing? Well, thanks. It's a complicated question. And you know, um, I'll confess to all of you, I am no Jody Green. She were here, she could probably give you a really great answer. Mm -hmm. So I think that that there I and I don't have good data at the top of my head, so I'm gonna tell you what I think. Uh, and you can take that with a grain of salt, right? I think that we're seeing still the effects of the pandemic on students in terms of learning losses that they experience. And in mental health, mental health can, is, continues to be a great challenge. Mm -hmm. And that those some of those mental health issues are, are exacerbated by our housing challenges, I know. Uh, you know, I think that um, the, the faculty and the Center for Teaching and Learning and IRAPs have just done such an amazing job working on strategies to change the curriculum, to change the pedagogy. You know, Susan, you've been involved in that and many others uh, too. And that's starting to bear, bear some real results. So focusing in on gateway courses and looking at the attrition from those gateway courses, you know, in some cases it's dropped from being like, 70% of the students pass to 93% of the students passing introductory calculus. So that's a huge change. But in addition, rather than just focusing on who makes it through the course, we're focusing on competency defined by getting a B or better. Okay, I'm a chemist, right? We have seen every year, probably still in the chemistry department, the students who get through the first year of chemistry with a C or C minus, and then they move on to organic chemistry and wow, right? They get slammed. So you, so students have to build that competency. So they're really prepared to go on. So not only are we looking at that across the course, but breaking it down to look at it by demographic groups. So a faculty member can say, okay, here the average grade for my courses would be minus. Uh, and so student demographics, I want to know how did my first gen students do? How did the, the transfer students do? How did the Hispanic students do? And so you can look at that and then know whether or not you're really reaching students uh, and, and uh, kind of in an equitable way. 
that's a big job. Uh, and we're not going to get there overnight, but we're sure asking the right kinds of questions and doing the work that I think will help that happen. So I think those things uh, will help to support our students in their future success. And we did hire a new associate vice chancellor for student health and wellness. He is really terrific. And I think he's focusing on ways to help students through CAPS and through other, other efforts to support them in their physical and mental well-being. Okay, well, thank you very much, Cindy. I know you have another meeting coming up. Thank you. Okay, so we hope our, our last Maritime luncheon will be in May, and our speaker is going to be James Duchet Battle. He's, going, he's from sociology, but he's talking about climate change. So it should be an interesting science, social science combination. That's the 18th of May. Third Thursday in May. Hope to see you all there. Okay. Thank you.